This is a Group 7 sports racer, weighing in at about 1,600 pounds and packing 750 horsepower engines. These cars are considered to be the fastest road racing cars in the world, capable of speeds in excess of 200 miles per hour. For the past several seasons, the Canadian American Challenge Cup for Group 7 cars has been dominated by the powerful McLaren team founded by the late Bruce McLaren in England. But now there's a new force to be reckoned with. The car, a Porsche 91710, powered by a 900 horsepower turbocharged engine, was built to put an end to the McLaren supremacy. But it takes more than a fast car to win. It takes great preparation and an organized team effort. Porsche has found these qualities in an American racing team, Roger Penske Racing. The nucleus of the operation is Roger Penske. Roger, having retired as a driver with victories under his belt in Corvettes, the Xerox Special, and Jim Hall's famous Chaparral, teamed with Mark Donahue, a graduate engineer from Brown University. Working with Roger, Mark joined the team with three national championships already to his credit. The team has set the standard of excellence for the racing world, winning three Trans-American Sedan Championships, twice in Camaros and with the Javelin in 1971, racking up victories in Formula A, World Manufacturers Championship Racing, and finally in May of 1972, taking the most coveted prize of all, the Indianapolis 500. Looking for new areas to conquer, Penske Racing has decided to apply its so-called magic touch to the Can-Am series, which has been the property of the McLaren team since 1967. The car we've selected uh, for this year's championship car was Porsche successfully campaigned throughout Europe and the United States over the last three years. We decided to pick the Porsche because it had a basic strong chassis. The running components had been proven. We felt that Porsche's interest in putting a turbocharged engine on the Can-Am circuit would really make a great interest as far as our sponsors were concerned and also a chance to possibly beat the, the four-year McLaren domination. We are running the turbocharged engine basically the same way we have done it in Indianapolis. And the speeds today at Indy are 195 miles an hour. With the same amount of work in this car, and with the work that Mark has done in Europe, he spent more than three months in Europe running a test car there. We've run a test car in this country. We're sure that we can become competitive. Of course, we don't know until we run a race, and that'll be the real test. Well, this is the final test of our work that's been going on now since about November. We spent probably a total of 2,500 to 3,000 miles of testing in Germany and the likewise amount here in the United States. And now it's time for our final exam, you can say. And the car is as thoroughly tested as any race car we've ever presented at Penske Racing. I think I am quite more optimistic about the performance of this car than I have been about any other car that we've tested and developed and then brought to a racetrack. But uh, it won't be until Sunday until we know exactly how successful and how good all this testing really was. Gathered here at Mossport Park in Canada for the first race in the series are the top Can-Am teams in the world. Bringing with them such drivers as Peter Revson, and ex-world champion Dennis Holm, both driving new factory-entered M20s for the McLaren team. And another Formula One driver, Jackie Oliver, driving the newly revamped Shadow Mark III. The official practice gives the teams who haven't tested here a chance to set up their cars for the track, binding wing and chassis settings and tire compounds which are suited to the Mossport circuit. For the teams who have already tested here, such as Penske Racing, there is the opportunity to assess the competition, find out how the car handles in traffic, and fine-tune the chassis for the race. Thorough testing is essential to win, and the Penske team has obviously done its homework, having set the pace from the outset, an honor usually reserved for Team McLaren. Brakes, but it's okay. And also, uh, 
retired? Oh, yeah, that's what I said. So take your time. You checking the pressures, all right? Well, after the first practice session, we're a little less than a second quicker than the quickest McLaren, which means that we're at least competitive. But it still doesn't necessarily give us a, an edge on winning the race, which is the most important thing. Qualifying is yet to come up, and we'll have to wait and see what, what they come up with for qualifying. While the others are feverishly trying to extract every bit of power from their machines, the Penske crew, having an obvious advantage over the rest of the field as a result of the advanced preparation and testing, merely trim the car for the qualifying battle that will determine the positions on the starting grid. cars leave the pits and head onto the track, Roger and his timing crew pay close attention to Mark's times, as well as those of other drivers, including Oliver in the Shadow, which arrived at Mossport a much more competitive car than last year. As a result, being one of the front runners as the season opens. And of course, the most potent opposition to the L&M Porsche, the defending champion McLarens. In qualifying, the drivers attempt to put together a series of perfect corners, striving to achieve that perfect lap in order to get the best possible starting position. Often, the teams will use a special sticky tire compound and push the engines a little extra in search of some additional speed and power on the track for short periods of time. To no one's surprise, as the checkered flag dropped on the session, the L&M Porsche came home with the fastest lap time, followed by Revson and Holm with Oliver in fourth position. Mark Donahue, there's the trophy itself. Uh, I'm sure Patty will give that to you at this time. <laughs> And you are the pole winner for this year's Labatt Blue Can-Am, and do you have some thoughts on that, Mark? Well, the pole position is the matinee, and uh, the feature is today, and uh, all the cars are running very well, I think. And uh, It's a 200-mile race, and we'll have to see what happens at the end. But I'm very appreciative of this trophy from Patty, and uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great honor for me to, uh, to receive it. For the drivers, the moment of truth is fast approaching as members of the crews begin readying pit equipment in case a mechanical problem occurs during the race. Others are involved in mapping out carefully laid strategic plans so important in a 200-mile event. The crowd, which began to form on Friday, is packed into every available space in the infield and around the track. All here to see these top drivers, teams, and cars do battle in this, the first of what promises to be the most spectacular Can-Am series since the formula was conceived in 1966. The cars are rolled onto the grid. Although each team has done all within its power to avoid problems, it is here where the great equalizer of racer's luck enters the picture. Sitting next to Mark on the front row is Peter Revson. Both cars in top shape as the drivers buckle up for the start. flag drops, the L&M Porsche immediately jumps into the lead, out dragging Revson down the pit straightaway and through turns one and two. Mark, knowing he is driving the superior machine, enjoys his advantage and sprints away from the field. enjoying a comfortable margin on the field, suddenly nearing the midpoint of the race, the L&M Porsche begins to lose power and is passed, forfeiting the lead and limps into the pits. The outlook very bleak for Mark. Uh, evidently, there was a loss in power, and when the car came in, we weren't sure what the problem was, and once it was diagnosed, it was a, a problem with our 
intake system, just a valve stuck. It was just a normal, probably dirt or something got in, in the valve. We lubricated it and freed it up, and then the car was operating fine. Any kind of a pit stop, no matter how short, is disastrous in a Can-Am race. Due to their length and the large fuel capacity of the cars, they are considered sprints, normally run without any stops. The problem encountered, although minor and easily repaired, is devastating to the LM Porsche's chances of a good finish in spite of its tremendous speed and power advantage. The longer the car sits in the pits, the more ground the McLarens put between themselves and Mark. The lid is going on the back of Mark Donahue's LM Porsche. They're fitting it on. The crew is moving. They've got to nail this lid on quick and get him back. Losing three and a half minutes in the pits after running so well casts a tremendous disappointment over the crew. Having worked so hard to achieve the advantage the car had only heightens the frustration of a minor incident ruining the chance of a flag-to-flag -flag victory in the car's maiden voyage. All Mark can do to avenge his misfortune is to take off after the McLarens and shrink their lead as much as possible. And take off he did. Driving like a man possessed by the devil, Mark sliced through the field, passing on the inside and outside of corners, closing in on the leaders. In spite of the LM Porsches being able to unlap itself and pick up 15 seconds on the leader during the last lap, Holm, having inherited the lead from Revson, whose engine let go on the pit straight, crossed the finish line first. His brakes gone, unable to withstand the pressure offered by the charging Mark Donahue, who came across in second position, working his way up from seventh. Although they may have lost the battle, it seems not unlikely that Penske Racing and the LM Porsche will win the war, with no doubt left in anyone's mind that the McLarens have finally been dethroned as the kings. The LM Porsche has clearly established itself as the class of the field. And although McLaren won, perhaps by default, the challenger has definitely made his point. Good shot. Well, here they are on stage for those that are uh, watching from the grandstand area and so on. There's the winner of the uh, 1972 Can-Am, Denny Hall. Good to have him back and he's looking well. Standing beside him, of course, is Miss Labatt's Blue Can-Am, Corey Anderson. And let's think, turn things over to the President General Manager of Labatt's Ontario Breweries Limited, Mr. Bruce Elliott, for the presentation of the award. Congratulations again. That was a great race. It's a great pair, eh? Ladies and gentlemen, your winner. Now, if we can get all the winners, we'll yeah. give the photographers another crack at all the winners here and Miss Labatt's Blue Can-Am. Maybe we can get Corey right in the middle there. Jim, there we are. Oh, what a shot that is. you'll be all set for the next adventure along with Denny and the Gulf McLaren team down road Atlanta, eh? Uh, we will. <laughs> I don't know if we'll go or not. I'm pretty sure we will. 